Namaste, Ajin. Welcome, welcome to our yeah, Hisa conversations. Uh, so uh, good to see you after so many years. Yes, that's true. I don't know how many. Must be about twenty, twenty-five years, maybe. So, what would be uh, your earliest recollection, maybe even from childhood, of either the idea or the any experience of uh, non-violence? Well, the thing is that um, I was born in January nineteen forty-seven. My father had actually gone in 1946 to help set up the Indian embassy in China because India was getting independence. So when I was three months old, I was wrapped up in cotton wool and my mother took me in a cargo plane to China. And I spent two years in uh, Nanking and four years in Beijing. And I went to a school there, a Christian school, but my first language was Chinese. So I only spoke Chinese for six years. Then I came to India for one year after that, and went to Sanawar, and then went to the United States for uh, four years. So between the ages of seven and eleven, I was probably in the United States. I went to a school called Ethical Culture School, which seemed to know about Mahatma Gandhi. And second, being an Indian there, my father was in the. Uh, uh, I'd get I'd be told by my parents about the national movement and. Uh, And Gandhi. It's really in um, okay. It's really in the states when I got to um, uh, hear about, and of course, being an Indian and uh, want, and uh, my parents told me about the national movement. They were firm supporters of the Congress Party, so I got to know about it then. So But it's uh, that was up to eleven, and I came to India. Okay. Does it mean that you were living in China when the uh, Mao came to power? That's right. I was there from 1947 to 1953. Mao took part in, uh, in uh, what do you call it, uh, in 1949. And I, my parents tell me that as a child, I used to come home uh, after the Mao's taking care, and used to say, "We Chinese and those damn Americans." Right. <laughs> Then from seven or eleven, when I was in the United States. And I was going to school there. I used to come home and say, "Oh, those terrible communists! We Americans." <laughs> That my father is in the foreign service. Uh, uh, the first, uh, well, I came back to India in uh, uh, after in 1954. Uh, no, 1954 to 58, I was in the U.S. I came back in 1958. I went to Saint Columbus for five years. There, of course, one got to know about Gandhi and the national movement and all that. Mm-hmm. I'm very fond of. Uh, Uh, Hindi films and Hindi film songs, so of course you get an idea generally. And then in '63, after doing my senior Cambridge, I went to West Africa for a year, uh, Ghana. And then from Ghana, I went to England for the next uh, month, from 1964 to uh, uh, till 1975. I got my degree at uh, at Bristol University in economics and statistics. And then I worked for a year as a chartered accountant. I didn't like it. Then I said I want to make some money and come back to India. So I worked for three years in a casino, huh? as a <laughs> yeah. And then I was got active, then politically active. We set up something called the campaign for the release of Indian political prisoners. We had set up a group. This was 1975. Yes. So yes. then, during the emergency, it sounds more dramatic. But I came to India during the emergency underground, and went back to England, worked for a while to earn some money, and came back for good in '78. And then I was so, in Times of India. How did this uh, mixture of experiences um, hmm. lead you to work on this issue of both nuclear power safety and the threat of nuclear weapons? Is there well, a connection? Yes, yes, there is. In the sense that I, I, I feel like I'm a child of the '60s and '70s. Um, different people were radicalized in different parts of the world. I was radicalized uh, basically in England, uh, as first part of the anti-racist movement, and then a more general uh, uh, wanting to transform uh, politics. And in the '70s, especially to the latter part, you had huge anti-nuclear movements. Anti-nuclear weapons movements that emerged. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. India in 1974 had 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 its first Pokhran one, peaceful nuclear explosion, right? So one was opposed to that. I came back during the emergency, 
and then went back. So that was the radicalizing uh, context in which I began to think not so much about nuclear energy, but about nuclear weapons. Yeah, yeah. Ajit, as someone who has studied these issues very closely, uh, for the purposes of our audience, can you just walk us through the opposition within the scientific community pretty much from the moment of the detonation at Los Alamos. Can you kind of give us an overview of how and why a substantial portion of the science community stood up mm -hmm. against nuclear weapons? Well, one has to be very cautious about them. First of all is that they all were prepared to um, operate within the Manhattan Project hmm? um, because of World War II. Uh, and because there was some uh, suspicion that Germany under Hitler may be preparing nuclear weapons. When it became clear by 1944 that Hitler was, and Germany was far away from making nuclear weapons, only one scientist, I think Leo Schiller, uh, left the Manhattan Project. The others, including Robert Oppenheim and others, stayed. Mm -hmm. And the United States used two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, these uh, two bombs are of different types of plutonium and uranium bomb, and they wanted to test to get an idea of it. Why did they drop those bombs? One, of course, they wanted to know what, how it worked. Uh, they had carried out, of course, at Los Alamos, but they didn't, uh, uh, that was secret. They didn't carry out a public demonstration. That was one. Second is that they did it because they were also worried, uh, apart from wanting to see the effects of uh, of nuclear weapons uh, on, on, on people and their radiation, uh, you know, uh, monitoring afterwards and so on. Uh, the Soviet Union through, through Mongolia was also coming closer and they wanted a surrender, a formal surrender by the emperor in Japan, Japan before the Soviet Union comes in. It was unlike in Europe then, then they could have a say in making the arrangements. So this was in fact also motivated by the fact that they want to get uh, the Japanese surrender quickly, which happened virtually immediately, and they did that. Okay. After this, there were scientists who were shaken by what had happened. And some scientists then said that we must do something about it and move towards, this is such a terrible weapon, we must move towards some kind of denuclearization. And there were two plans that came up. The first plan, I don't know if you're familiar, that was the, called the Atchison Linenthal uh, plan, right? And this plan was that we will go to the UN, we'll try to set up an at atomic development authority, huh? and we will promote nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. But this must come under uh, public control. And of course, uh, we also want to move towards nuclear disarmament and the UN body that we set up should monitor and to make sure that uh, no other country can have nuclear weapons or move in the direction of having nuclear weapons. There should be the power of sanctions and so on. And now this plan, the atchison Lillington plan, did not say anything about when the United States would get rid of its nuclear weapons. Hmm? And then you had what was called the Baruch plan, because Baruch was the person, Bernard Baruch, who was sent to the UN by the US. And he strengthened the plan in the sense of saying that nobody should be able to have a veto and that there should be complete freedom. The Soviets were upset by this and they put forward their own plan called the Grimiko plan, saying that, look, we should move towards this thing, but first the United States must get rid of its nuclear weapons. Huh? And that we have a veto power also over the kind of inspections and all, you can't just disregard that because the UN Security Council, uh, there were five countries which are the permanent members plus Canada, which had also been part of the Manhattan Project was also brought in plus some other non-permanent members here and was really dominated by the West. Uh, so that really was uh, uh, the extent to which initially uh, scientists there. However, there were some scientists that uh, and later on who came up and stood out very categorically against nuclear weapons. Yeah. Let me give you certain important examples over here. These were people who had also been part of the, the process of trying to understand the atom and how it fissions and all Niels Bohr hmm? uh, and others. One very important example, of course, was Einstein. What did Einstein say? He said, if I had known that my physics would help to make uh, nuclear weapons, uh, 
I would have preferred to be a watchmaker. Hmm? That's something that he said. Uh, and uh, so there were scientists. Then later on, another Nobel Prize winning scientist called Richard Feynman, uh, who won the Nobel Prize, yeah, came out there. So then you had a somewhat division between scientists in the United States and elsewhere. There was what was called the Federation of Atomic Scientists. Huh? Some talked about controlling, securing, but not prepared to go all out to say everybody must get rid of it. So there has been a division among scientists. And if you come to the Indian context, what's very interesting is that very few scientists in India have any real stature. In fact, Meghnath Saha was one, who unlike uh, Omi Baba, didn't want to have anything to do with nuclear weapons. Whereas Homi Baba was putting pressure on Nehru that maybe we should keep the option and not just have uh, a new, uh, a nuclear energy or a nuclear department for atomic energy or peaceful uses, but let's also consider that. So there's a whole history about that over here. Meghnath Saha was one Indian scientist that was very courageous. Later on, hmm, uh, in, in 1974, you have the test and in 1998, you, you had the nuclear test. And the left parties, uh, CPI, CPM, did not oppose the 1974 test, which was called the peaceful nuclear test. All parties then, except for the Jansam, which had always wanted nuclear weapons, even before China or Pakistan, let alone Pakistan had it. China got the bomb in 1964. But even before that, Jansam wanted the bomb because that was part of their ideology of uh, uh, unite Hindus and militarize Hinduism, if you like. So they had always wanted that. But all other parties, including the left, were for keeping the option open. In 1998, when the test took place, the left parties came out in opposition to what had happened in 1998. But in their statement opposing the Pokhran II test, they also lauded the scientists for their scientific skills. Hmm? Uh, and one scientist who was, became president of India and was associated as a scientocrat with this was Abdul Kalam, right? And of course, he lauded the uh, achievement here. But there was one scientist in India in the 50s, and he was a scientist who won the Nobel Prize in India, not working in the laboratories in the US like some other scientists, such as Indians are origin scientists, got, got Nobel Prizes in science. He was an Indian scientist who got a Nobel Prize and in India working in a laboratory, and he said something in 1957. He said, scientists should starve rather than help make nuclear weapons. Do you know who and who that was scientist? this? C.B. Raman. So there's a great difference between somebody like him in the Indian context and many other scientists who are associated with this thing and hail the thing or this thing here. And it's unfortunate that so many scientists have not been prepared in India to take the kind of stand that C.B. Raman have. We have examples of scientists in the West at least coming out against their countries. We don't have any example of the Chinese scientists coming out there. And apart from C.B. Raman, I can't think of any other. I have some scientists associated with the left later that are opposed to that here. But prominent scientists here, no. In fact, one scientist won the Nobel Prize for Pakistan was also critical of nuclear weapons. And that was the, in, in physics, uh, Abdul Salam uh, uh, and Ahmadiyya. So you've had this division, if you like. I've given you a long answer, but I'm saying that uh, it's important to recognize. And of course, we need scientists to come out against it because everything uh, depends yeah. on it. Okay. Yeah. So this is one side of the story, Achin. The other side is that despite this and other uh, political activists and ordinary citizens' opposition, pretty much across the world, the military industrial complex succeeded, right? On both sides of the Iron Curtain in the huge stockpile that we knew was in place by mid 860s or late 60s, you know, by when we knew uh, my, I'm born in 58 and my generation grew up knowing, knowing that the world now had enough nuclear weapons to destroy the whole planet many times over, right? Uh, so how how much of this was a f factor of political economy? Okay, well, there's something one has is that the whole process by which nuclear weapons emerged 
I think is important. Why do countries go in for nuclear weapons, right? They go in for nuclear weapons and they give three reasons, if you like. Huh? They all say it's because the other side has it, we must have it. Huh? Second, uh, they say, if you like, is, the, uh, is for st status, prestige, hmm? the important part. A third reason is it helps our foreign policy. Okay, the three reasons. Now, if you look at the countries that have nuclear weapons, huh? there are nine countries that have nuclear weapons. The reasons why most of them, the main reason why most of them differs. Which was the first country to have nuclear weapons? The United States. In 1944, it became clear Germany does not have it. They still went ahead. It wasn't because some other country had it. Hmm? In the case of Russia, it was because the US have it, we have to have it. Hmm? In the case of China, there was already the Sino-Soviet split in 1964. Hmm? The Chinese said the Russians have it, Soviets have it, the Americans have it, we have to have it, reactive. Why did the British and the French have it? It had much more to do with prestige. Declining colonial powers, we will sit at the high table. We'll have that, okay? India decides in 1998 and even 1974, 10 year gap after uh, this year, Indira Gandhi had it largely for domestic purposes. You know, the decline there, JP movement, railway strike, this would be a sense of prestige. And in 1998, in fact, I wrote a book in 95, in which I was one of the very few people to predict that if the BJP comes to power, they'll have it. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll go for it. That book, uh, very few people were prepared to say that when I wrote the book. I can't think of anybody publicly who said that. Huh? But it has much more to do with prestige. In the case of Pakistan, reactive to India. You have it, we must have it. Although you have it here. Huh? So you have this here. And in this whole process, and of course, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, North Korea had it, reactive. And Israel, of course, had it in order to defend its so-called security or whatever. Huh? For that year. And all of this, at least on the global level, in terms of what you're talking about, in terms of stockpiling and all that, the United States was the, always the pace setter and the others reacting, which doesn't mean that you can justify the others doing that because there were also countries that some 40 odd countries and some outside of the nuclear umbrella uh, of other countries that had the capacity but decided not to. Huh? So I'm not excusing the Chinese thing here. What I'm saying is that in the case of the pace setter in the United States, that was one pressure political. The second pressure, if you like, was the military industrial complex, hmm? which uh, obviously benefits from pushing all kinds of militarization and nuclearization. And in fact, it was only had something of a hiatus and this pressure was weakened after the Soviet Union collapsed. And for about four or five years from 1991 to 1995, uh, the American civilian government was resisting pressure from the military industrial complex to go ahead. But then that subsequently changes. And that pressure in the United States is not just a military industrial complex, it's a military industrial universities complex. So let's bring that in also, and which has been pushing it and is in constantly pushing it. In the case of the Soviet Union, they of course, in order to react said that, and the only uh, uh, department of the Soviet Union, which was given all kinds of funding and support was of course the military. And therefore they also have a vested interest and also maintaining it so as to be able to have that. In fact, the United States was much healthier economy than the uh, Soviets, which is why the Soviet Union had to spend a much larger amount of money for its military industrial complex to sustain itself uh, uh, and to try to uh, uh, equate with the United States of America. So there was always this thing about strategic nuclear parity there. So that of course is there and they continue to be tremendous pressure here so-called Obama Nobel Prize nonsense. Within the United States establishment, the military industrial complex has been arguing for modernization. Obama, modernization. Biden, modernization. The Soviets, also modernization. The Chinese, more cautious, but also modernizing, maintaining the activity. What does modernization mean today in practical terms, uh, Achin? When we say that we modernization of nuclear weapons, is it taking them into space or what? More than that, it's of course, uh, there's what's called the revolution of military affairs, which means that you have all kinds of guidance systems and all. You have radars, you have all that. So you can, of course, be much more accurate. 
huh? you're developing submarines and then, then you're developing nuclear powered submarines and then you're also developing anti submarine uh, warfare techniques uh, and then you're also developing much more uh, 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 precision guided uh, 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 ballistic missiles carrying warheads you are uh, advancing uh, you know, generally you're advancing all kinds of developments here you're going into space and you're now having a, a violation of what's called the uh, uh, paros the treaty against uh, the militarization of space out of space well oh, that's already happening of course it's happening you're also happening here in fact what did you again this was where the united states one of the uh, one of the best developments during the cold war era was what was called the anti ballistic missile treaty in which both sides uh, the soviets and the americans agreed that they will not try to develop a defense shield let me try to explain this a little bit in prehistoric times huh, or sorry, pre, uh, yeah prehistoric times one side gets weapons like uh, uh, spears or or swords right mm. and the mm. other side also tries to have that then one side develops shields mm. right so the side that has a shield as well as sword huh, and spears has an advantage over the other side okay now deterrence according to uh, nuclear those who up, uh, hold nuclear deterrence theory is that there's always the danger that one side might strike first hmm? so if one side strikes the other first we must have enough nuclear weapons so that even if they strike first we'll have enough left over to hit them in which case they won't strike first so if you like one dynamic of nuclear weapons stockpiling is precisely this first strike you must have what's called a second strike capability the united states after the end of the cold war and from 1995 onwards started to develop a ballistic missile defense shield which is basically if you like two kinds one is that we will have a ballistic missile which can hit the other country's ballistic missile which has a nuclear warhead so one missile will hit out it's like a bullet hitting out the other bullet huh also we will put in outer space and we will move towards having if you like star wars type things laser this that hit it in outer space and have all kinds of guidance mechanisms and so on this was what the americans started doing with this ballistic missile defense shield and what was called theater missile defense shield which then worried the uh, russians and the chinese a lot because then the russian chinese said they have this defense shield if they hit us first then their defense shield can mop up what we have left over so then they tried to counter that by having decoys and by making what was called uh, on one missile 12 warheads so even if one missile gets through it can hit 12 cities huh plus of course you so you begin to have all that uh, all kinds of uh, and what will happen is we'll make our bombs much much bigger so that even if one missile goes it'll do devastating damage and this will so you got an arms race and this arms race is carrying on yeah so yeah. this already saying, is starting yeah I, I, two things are chant here one is uh, how do we what you're talking about was also known as mad am i right mutually assured destruction so oh, mutually assured destruction was uh, uh, was there in which both sides supposed to have a second strike capability right but right. when the united states began to build this defense shield huh then the other side said well it's not mutually assured destruction if they hit us first they may be able to mop up most of us but not left hence the uh, uh, escalation you see okay. so now okay. the only difference is that the in during the uh, cold war there were about 70000 nuclear weapons hmm? today they are down to about 20 25 about 16000 um, what do you call it uh, deployed on on missiles and others about another 8000 4000 4000 5000 each roughly which are stored in there so they can be put on if necessary in other words neither the russians nor the uh, americans have destroyed their warheads they've only That's, stored them you have not given us figures for china china has about let's say 250 uh, china has just felt it had enough to hit it it didn't go for what is called counter value uh, counter uh, uh, counter force uh, thing i mean if I, do you want me to explain all this No, no i got the broad figure i But got the china broad is, idea china is a much more modest let me put it this way you have uh, uh, in 
and a couple of thousands deployed, and you have uh, four or five thousand uh, 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 stored by the U.S. and and Russia. The Chinese have about two fifty to three hundred nuclear warheads. The uh, Indians and Pakistanis have about one fifty one sixty each. Huh? Britain had now is pushing for getting around two hundred plus, huh? and the French has something uh, around that, and uh, Israel has maybe a hundred hundred and fifty or something. Like that. So compared to Russia and the uh, U.S., China has a much more modest uh, uh, arsenal. So, Ajahn, as someone who also has, you know, been studying and observing human condition and human history with a rather, you know, broad spectrum interest, how do you hmm. see that in the same hundred years, if we say just count even just the twentieth century? where we get the appearance of a uh, gandhi and of a persistent non violence movements you know even after gandhi for uh, right coming up to the present uh, that on and the, on the one hand non violent political action is constantly innovating and being used in diverse uh, situations and on the other hand we have this madness how do you see this i mean what how do you uh, juxtapose the two well uh, one of course is that there are divisions of all kinds uh, in society and one of the most important is, uh, divisions is a social division where is whereby it's only a minority that rules over others mm -hmm. historically you always had a minority ruling over others in the 20th century you have the emergence of what is called uh, liberal democracy right which means that those who rule over us have uh, there is some degree of accountability over them uh, ordinary public through elections are the legitimizers of those who rule uh, but let us not pretend to ourselves that they are the controllers of those who rule in other words it's one thing and that's important that you at least have some legitimacy through elections or whatever but you have a very unequal society in which in fact interesting enough especially since the late 70s you have a level of increasing inequality of income wealth and therefore of power hmm? which also means the erosion of democracy to a very great extent even in those liberal democracies that take place and the those who benefit from this system huh, want to keep on benefit and there are always all forms of ideological rationalization for that another problem is that increasingly now we have problems that can only be resolved on the global level but we live in a multiple nation state system in which you have each state pursuing its own national interests in courts and prioritizes that so let me give you four problems now which can only be resolved on the global scale hmm? one the question of ecological devastation two the question of nuclearization hmm? you will have to have some international elimination of nuclear weapons on earlier here three the most incredible inequalities of income and uh, and wealth do you know according to the undp you have 1.5 to 2 billion people who are malnourished or undernourished i'm not talking about basic needs like having social security education i'm talking about malnourishment undernourishment when we have enough food in the world then nobody needs to starve hmm? you have enormous inequality of and you have if you like the erosion of democracy or the substantive character of democracy everywhere hmm? as a result increasing militarization this that etc so you continue to have this process and you are not going to be able to separate the question of non violence comes in in the sense that there have non violence struggles which have taken place within countries to some extent you had non violence movements for example the movement against nuclear weapons hmm, which was one and of the now, largest and now against climate chaos and now against climate change but you will notice that after the end of the cold war because in europe and in uh, japan and elsewhere you don't uh, have a sense of felt danger oh the cold war uh, face off is uh, there you find uh, that there really isn't a large scale anti nuclear movement i was just mm -hmm. coming to that ajit i wanted you to talk about that specifically 
that I am often puzzled that today somebody who's 20 or even 30, uh, it's not an issue in their conversation at all. This threat, right. a very real threat of mass annihilation simply doesn't feature in people's consciousness. How did this come about? Well, I said that earlier on when you had this confrontation of the Cold War, right? You had, and it was led in Europe, and of course it was also in the West, and it was in Japan. One thing, let's understand about anti-nuclear movements. Anti-nuclear movements require very substantial involvement of the middle class. You have never had, in spite of Gandhi and Gandhiism being in India, you have never had a large-scale anti-nuclear movement in India. Right? The answer is, and in more th third world countries, the answer is very simple in many ways. Right? People are concerned with their everyday livelihood issues. In order for you to think about nuclear weapons and all, you have to have the leisure time, the facility to think about foreign policy, about interconnections on the global scale and all. People are absorbed in their everyday lives and all. They can see the relevance of non-alignment in their struggles for this issue or that issue and so on. But you've never had that. They were dumb. But now, what's also happened in the middle classes everywhere is that they've turned to the right. They are now much more scapegoating of various kinds. So this too is a particular factor. So you have one case that decline here. However, growing tensions between China and US and, and Russia and, and US and all that is leading to some degree, and you do have an anti-nuclear movement of some kind, huh? but not as large in terms of its mass actions. But let's remember that those anti-nuclear movements were historically, they were the largest single anti-nuclear move, uh, human movements in terms of numbers. You had a huge millions of people uh, mobilizing on a single day against the Iraq war. Yeah. But it's very difficult to keep yeah. it up, to yeah. constantly. Uh, so we have these movements, we have these struggles, uh, but of course we need much more. And you're going, and given the fact that countries are, uh, people are seduced by the call of our national security, national interest, huh? how do we move towards recognizing that these problems are universal? Your government, all your governments and all your uh, media, most of the government and media are preoccupied with what is good for our country. It's a small handful in the media and all that talk about going beyond this. But in that context in particular, Achind, I've never understood how we as Indians can be excited about nuclear weapons vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan because... Uh, Pakistan still has some distance, maybe, you know, from a very far target in India. But where in Pakistan could India drop a nuclear weapon and not feel the, uh, you know, the fallout of the radiation? Well, you am see, I, or am I, I wrong in this? Yes, yes. Uh, to a certain extent, you're right. And also to a certain extent, you're wrong. Oh. Uh, in fact, Pakistan has to have more nuclear weapons than India in order to hit uh, targets further away. India, it's much easier to hit. Uh, uh, Pakistan, right? No, no, but what no. I mean is that you can't hit Lahore, yeah, have, Lahore and not feel the uh, fallout in Amritsar. No, what you have are you have warheads of different kinds. Okay. Huh? Right? And you have uh, both sides, but you have uh, warheads of different kinds and different megatonnage. Okay. Hmm? Okay. Second is your targets are not necessarily cities. Your targets are also military installations because the idea is also, and this is what is very real problem, is that let's pinpoint where they have their nuclear weapons, which are not in cities, okay? They're elsewhere, okay? Let's target that. And if we can hit that, we don't need a big border to hit that. We can hit that, there'll be radiation there, huh? but much less it will come back to us over here. And if we do that, we won, because they won't have any. Huh? So it's not automatic. Plus you have things like cruise missiles. So you have different kinds of warheads. You have big warheads for the cities. You have that here. And of course, those that have nuclear weapons are saying we are only doing it for deterrence. Why are you worried about radiation? We're not going to use them. In fact, by having it, we're not going to use it. Hmm? If you like, there's a big contradiction within those who defend nuclear weapons. Huh? It's something like this. What is it that causes the danger of nuclear war? You, uh, to go to and ask in a, 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 a school, whatever. what is the cause of the danger of nuclear war? Answer, nuclear weapons. If you don't have nuclear weapons, you can't have nuclear war, right? Okay. What is the best way to deal with the risk of nuclear weapons, uh, of nuclear war? Answer, have nuclear weapons. 
you see the contradiction right so this is it so this carries on and we've had some very very close brushes the difference between nuclear and military is that you have a deterrence factor in conventional weapons we need to be strong and have tanks and all that in order to prevent the other side from using their tanks but if that fails huh there'll be war but not everything will be finished now if there's a small nuclear exchange between india and pakistan the whole world because of nuclear winter will be affected huh? and yet what did einstein say he said nuclear weapons have changed everything except the way people think yeah so the question is how do you change people's thinking and how so, do you generate a mass movement to fight it as yeah so what i'm hearing you say really is that at in in the thing at the thinking level that we are as primitive as when we were running around with spears and shields are you saying that i'm not i'm saying is that on the question of nuclear weapons uh, um, uh, uh, don't generalize or universalize uh, responsibility the crooks are the nine the crooks are the nine nuclear weapon states there are 40 odd nuclear countries uh, it's not difficult to make a nuclear bomb there are 40 45 countries that can make the nuclear bomb i've decided not to let me give you some examples hmm? one country that needs no lessons from anybody about how to defend their independence is vietnam they fought against the most powerful country in the world 58000 american soldiers roughly died and 2 or 3 to 4 million indo chinese died in that war but they are vietnam has a 10000 year history a thousand year history of enmity with china India before 1962 has no history of uh, enmity with China. Okay, Vietnam has in 1979 the Chinese conventionally invade Vietnam. The Vietnamese push them out, give them a bloody nose. The Vietnamese can make nuclear weapons. They have decided not to. And what what But, was the process by which they they came to that? Decision? Because you see, the point about nuclear weapons is that it is so a strategic. it's not that but because people think it's so important for prestige reasons and all this thing here let me give you an example what is what is the nuclear the nuclear threat is an extreme threat right it's an extreme threat huh it is so extreme that it doesn't have fungibility you can't translate that threat into actual gains on ordinary factors bangladesh does not have nuclear weapons india has can india uses nuclear weapons to sort the border issue can india use nuclear weapons to get a better trade deal huh huh can china uses nuclear weapons to bully the vietnamese to do everything for them huh can the united states use its nuclear weapons huh to bully some small country that you just have to listen to us the threat is so extreme that is not translatable yes Meaning it's not plausible. plausible it's not believable not it's not it's not just believable it's not it, it it's it's very ineffective what is only effective is that you have your jay shankars and this and that and all the rest of this bunch huh who feel oh good we come from a nuclear weapons country we are top dogs huh and since their uh, counterparts in the us and britain france and china also think like that so to some extent say you are a top dog country yes yes we can come together and do that so that element is there and it can translate into some extent oh we take you more seriously than a non nuclear country and so on but when you want to translate that you know the third point i made as a kind of um, a support for your foreign policy uh, perspective it's very 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 weak, weak to the point of almost being so unimportant that's why you talk about the question of a strategic message here yeah. but the important thing is that there are people who think that so apart from the question of nuclear deterrent let me give you an example mm -hmm. huh Mm -hmm. something that is very interesting the indian case all these people vajpai uh, lieutenant general vij who was head of the uh, head of the chief um, um, uh, army uh, head of the armed forces and abdul kalam who was the bjp presidential candidate this was around then hmm? and you had the um, uh, 2000 and uh, uh, 2002 um, uh, what do you call it 2001 2001 attack in in mumbai remember 2008 2008 um when was abdul um, uh, 2008 that was in no that there was, was a 2002 in delhi 
that's parliament uh, parliament 2001 i think it was uh, in delhi to the, the parliament right after that you had the most prolonged period of uh, tension between india and pakistan on their borders for about 8 9 months hmm? where both sides readying themselves a nuclear weapons huh? and you had three different positions uh, you had um, i think it was musharraf then who said you know because pakistan has got nuclear weapons india could not dare to use it against us huh? you had vajpai saying huh? we taught the pakistanis a lesson huh? because we had nuclear weapons they couldn't dare to uh, do anything to us huh? we prevented a nuclear war huh? uh, uh, so what is he saying uh, he was saying that uh, this is against nuclear then you had uh, uh, sorry that was a part nuclear you had vij um saying uh, uh, no you had uh, abdul kalam saying that's right abdul kalam saying because we had nuclear weapons pakistan could not attack us conventionally even hmm? you have vij all of them support the idea of deterrence but they can't even agree on what it deters vajpay deterred nuclear war abdul kalam it deterred conventional attack vij says no 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 nuclear weapons can deter the other side from using nuclear weapons but it can't deter them from using the non nuclear conventional forces so you have three top dogs who believe in the importance of having nuclear weapons they believe in the notion of deterrence but they differ about how effective it is as a deterrence towards what it shows you if you like this tremendous ambiguity and all from these so called people who are supposed to be a top strategic experts in this that or whatever etc so you have this particular uh, dilemma or uh, problem here um yeah so you uh, you would wanted to ask me about something else no yeah. i uh, in this context how do we now look at the banning the 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 january 2021 development where the un has now uh, declared nuclear weapons to be illegal am i right and what is that the implication was, that was not by the un that was done by the uh, by the way as i told you i gave the example of vietnam in the yeah. 1960s uh, sweden was independent from um, from uh, was quite independent and sweden was discussing whether they should have nuclear weapons because the soviet union is closer to them mm -hmm. than it is to britain britain said we must have it sweden which was independent throughout the second world war uh, and has compulsory conscription by the way and has very sophisticated conventional weapons discussed this and said we don't want nuclear weapons brazil thought for a long time should we keep the option open eventually decide big country we don't want it vietnam decided we don't want it huh a small uh, uh, vietnam's population 80 90 million britain 65 70 million wants it huh uh, you have uh, uh, a small country um, uh, other uh, austria which is decided we don't want it whatever you have a small country like um, uh, israel huh we must have it hmm? mexico decided not to, uh, so i'm saying it's again related to that Uh, your question was about the, um, uh, the, the sorry about the, the nuclear weapons becoming illegal yes. that became not because of the un that was by uh, what was called the uh, international campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons which won the nobel prize in 2017 and this had a, first time they had a treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons and this is the first treaty hmm, which uh, says that this is illegal it's criminal and all what is the purpose of such a treaty the purpose of such a treaty i think is important to understand it's like in the 19th century and even early 20th century you had slavery right you need to you are not going to eliminate slavery first and then have an international uh, law or treaty that criminalizes it you have to have an international law or treaty that criminalizes it huh and says this is something that is criminal and that becomes a small step forward in getting rid of it so the fact that you have a treaty of uh, prohibition is like saying that you nuclear weapons countries huh, are a bunch of criminals you are trying to win the battle it's like the battle against uh, 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 against apartheid you have to get across to people that apartheid is evil hmm? whether you're doing non violence gandhi whatever you have to get across the idea that this is something illegal you have to win that ideological mental battle in many ways also here yeah. Yeah. remember what einstein said people yeah. think and you yeah. have to get more and more people to think so that is what was the importance of that treaty 
And, and of course, other countries who are part of it saying that we won't go ahead and do that because right. so many countries can. No, Ajin, you have been very involved in trans-border kind of civil society efforts between Indian civil society actors and Pakistani civil society, people including scientists who have hmm. tried to work together, not just for a general peace between India and Pakistan, which of course, there are many more forums also that have done that but particularly on the nuclear issue. So is there any hope uh, at a citizen's level of a greater momentum against the absurdity of nuclear weapons? It will take time. And of course, I, I pointed out the difficulties in countries that are much poorer in terms mm -hmm. of most people being preoccupied. I don't know if you know that when the poll was taken immediately after the 1998 tests, mm -hmm. huh? Over forty, over forty-five percent had not even heard of the test in India. Hmm? Of course, of course, people have heard about it now and all the rest. What I'm trying to say is that that is a problem uh, dilemma. What we have uh, for a long time is that there are two stages in any struggle. One stage is to raise enough awareness. Hmm? It is only when you are able to raise enough awareness that you will be able to have some impact on government policy. We are still at the stage in which we have to try to raise awareness. Yeah. Of what are the along, implications? What are the implications? In order to do this with the Indian public, for example, Pakistani public, there are two or three. Most people in India think of the bomb as some kind of uh, nuclear weapons as some kind of bigger bomb. Hmm? It's not necessarily that they understand the radiation effects, this, that, like all of that here. Huh? You carry out. And of course, you know, and you are also countering a media which is dominated even before this come dominated by militarism, nuclear security. Ordinary people, most people have what's called a stretch consciousness. What does that mean? Mm. It means that on issues that are close to them, huh, they are not going to be persuaded by uh, uh, faraway um, uh, media saying, they say, this is affecting us. Don't tell us that we shouldn't have a strike. This is wrong, what you're doing. Don't tell us we do that. But if it's something far away, should India have bomb or not? They are much more inclined to go along with what is the general consensus, what is the general view they see on TV, on the media, or social media. That's a stretch consciousness. Huh? What you have to do, of course, is to raise that awareness in a variety of ways. And that's a considerable long-term struggle. And this is also affected internationally. Mm -hmm. I yeah. expect that the international national in the Indian context on the nuclear question, there is one country whose government has had the courage to uh, criticize India and Pakistan for going nuclear. Do you know which country that is? Bangladesh. Bangladesh was the one country huh, that said that. Before the, um, uh, the Maoists came to power in Nepal, I had gone to Nepal and I had talked to not just the leaders of the Maoists, but also the uh, leader, Tha Thapa, of the Congress uh, youth wing in Nepal. And I suggested to them, I said, look, you're, there's going to be here, you're going to have to redraw a constitution. Why don't you become the first country in the world huh, to have in your constitution huh, that you are a single state nuclear weapons free zone? The only country which is a single state nuclear weapons free zone is Mongolia. I said, you can become the only country in the world that has it in your constitution. They said, good idea, good idea, but nothing really a major hurt because the Indians also will put pressure on Nepal trying to move to uh, say we are a single state. But the one country in which at least in their parliament, there is, was at least a discussion about them becoming a single state nuclear weapons zone is Bangladesh. Bangladesh is next to what is called the Southeast Asian nuclear weapons free zone, which includes all the countries, including Vietnam, Philippines and others, which have said that we don't want nuclear weapons. That could be extended to take in Bangladesh or Bangladesh could move towards saying that. In other words, what I'm saying is that to change the kind of situation in South Asia, the weak spot is not necessarily India and uh, Pakistan where you have a government and a media and intellectuals of all kinds which are justifying this. But Bangladesh, because this is where your earlier point comes in, if there is a bomb thrown on Calcutta, it's going to affect uh, uh, Bangladesh, and they know it. So Bangladesh can be a kind of entry point uh, to try to raise this thing here. 
and yeah and that of course is something that uh, one fold so there are different levels at which we have to fight and if we want to actually fight against i will say one thing more and this is connected if you like to the question of non violence you can't separate the struggle against nuclear weapons from the struggle against militarism more generally yeah right so you point out the weaknesses of militarism how one is the guns versus butter we are a starving country we are spending so much money the second is the moral dimension right you are there so one also has to fight there but in order for you to successfully fight against militarism and so on you also have to fight against those who have power yeah because they are the ones this thing so you can't separate these issues yeah and you have yeah. to fight yeah. at the cultural yeah. level ideological level economic level political level. so in closing achin i just want to pose a, a, a somewhat philosophical question that hmm. gandhi is very emphatic position on the invention of atomic weapons or now what we call them nuclear weapons was that this has taken the logic of violence to its extreme form therefore he argued now actually if the species is to survive and thrive non violence is the only thing left in the field hmm. philosophically how do you respond to this well on the question of nuclear weapons it's fine even uh, gandhi's position on violence many people have pointed out those who are very sympathetic to gandhi that more important for him was the question of justice and the question of truth yeah, right yeah. and the, and therefore they, uh, he would even say that cowardice when somebody is coming to attack your family is the worst form of violence rather than self defense absolutely and yes so right so all that is there yeah. but uh, uh, so fine that's uh, okay on the question of nuclear weapons obviously we have to uh, move towards that but one of the real problems that i see over here is very interesting is that when you talk about marx or you talk about some others marxism whatever criticism you make about it has been more important than marx Gandhi has been more important than Gandhi's. This is a real problem, in many ways. With regard to the national uh, anti-nuclear movement, ask yourself. Look at you have had Gandhians defending uh, the acquisition of the bomb. Huh? So what has happened in many cases is that those who most admire and Gandhi is allowed to be admired about, they've gone into the philosophy of Gandhi. But as a movement. we have to ask ourselves why is it that in india why is it that in bloody gujarat huh there is so little of that impact over here and that raises questions of all kinds that we have to deal with over here gandhians should be and the gandhian movement should be the uh, 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 automatic uh, obvious and yes you have you have many gandhians in all mera patkar many others and uh, who admire and all who have been part of the anti nuclear movement but these are individuals and to small groups here why is it not spread further you had a movement in india which was uh, helped to bring about independence here yeah. so this then becomes here and uh, this raises uh, many questions about uh, 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 the approach to uh, generating a movement if i perhaps i can just end here by just i should end now Uh, whatever you you can wrap up if you want to and but do make a more substantial point where time is not an issue i can and you can ask me other questions i have no problems talking more is that uh, to my understanding um, one thing is of course is that um, two things about one, one of course was this importance on the question of the relationship between means and ends hmm? how can good means justify uh, good uh, good ends justify bad means right this is a philosophical concept of what's called prefiguration we must prefigure the society we want to reach and if that society is to be good then don't we have to use good means to reach that okay now this didn't come with only originate with gandhi he formulated in his own way but is something that also existed earlier and this concept of prefiguration which has come up in different traditions yeah in the 60s and 70s do you know the uh, the anarchist tradition had that uh, some said but do you know in the 60s and 70s which was the movement that most emphasized uh, the uh, the concept of prefiguration certainly in the west and here and to a certain extent in india it was a certain section of the women's movement it was section of the women's movement because you have different currents within the movements but there was a section within the movements 
which were emphasized in the question of um, um, prefiguration, this question of principle of prefiguration. The tricky thing here, of course, is that means come between ends and beginnings. And means cannot simply shape the end. Means themselves are going to be influenced by the beginnings. If the beginning is slavery, if the beginning is Hitler, then you cannot expect that only nonviolent means are going to be used here. And this is something that's very tricky. One has to understand the whole question of the state and Berlin. This is a tricky question. Gandhi and many others, Foucault and many others, fought against the notion of coercion. And coercion takes place in various ways. It takes place through socialization, it takes place through ideology. Therefore, you have to have the battle of ideas, you have to struggle all the way, coercion. Hmm? Coercion is everywhere. Huh? It's because of coercion that you have the subordination of women, patriarchy, caste. You and institutionalized to accept that, lower caste, but that is there's somebody below us and all the rest of it. You have all of this problem here. And coercion is wrong because it removes the freedom of agency of a person. Gandhi in his own way was emphasizing the centrality of the freedom of agency of people. Uh, he linked it to the question of the soul, we won't get into all that. But the point is that freedom of agency. And therefore he's opposed to coercion. Everybody is opposed to coercion. But there's a crucial difference between coercion and force. Coercion removes the freedom of agency of a person huh? or seeks to remove it or eliminate it. Force seeks to eliminate the person and thereby eliminate the freedom of agency. Hmm? And that becomes a very, very tricky thing in terms of um, uh, how you deal with that over here. Our resource is the mobilization of as many people as possible huh? to fight against that over here and to uh, change our thinking here. But I think this is uh, something that we really have to think about uh, uh, in terms of how we uh, fight. I've already said that we have to connect it to all kinds of struggles, anti-militarism, promotion of a better humane life and so on over here. So uh, we can be grateful that most countries that have the capacity have not done that. But unfortunately, uh, how do we break away from this uh, the trap of nationalism. I think you have to do it by first try to have a progressive nationalism and then understand the limits of even a progressive nationalism because a progressive nationalism cannot on its own address these problems. So if you like, in India today, we have uh, everybody, those who are not with the BJP sung, say that we are fighting for the soul of Indian nationalism. That's one. But let's also remember that there are limits to how progressive nationalism can be, there are no limits to how reactionary it can be. We have to go beyond nationalism to be able to address these human universal problems. So we have to develop a kind of fundamental universality. And if you like, in his own way, he was not the only one, but in his own way, Gandhi was committed to some idea, an idea of, of universality, rooted in his idea of, of human beings and the soul they have and all that. And, human, and humanism. And humanism, yes, humanism means uh, 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 this thing that universality. That means what? It means that I can be a white person and be against my government for, for supporting the, uh, against the US government for supporting the apartheid regime in South Africa. I don't have to be black. I can be a man and support the struggle of, against patriarchy. I can be an upper caste and support the struggle of lower caste. I can be, um, uh, uh, um, upper class and support uh, lower caste struggle. I can even be a military man who comes around to the Gandhian point of view, if you like. <laughs> so you can have all that, uh, I mean, that thing here. Thank and, you. Uh, that's, no, go ahead. And it's an, I just want to say that it's an open struggle yeah. in the sense that uh, the open ended. Uh, the um, we have the capacity to make a much better world, but we also have the capacity to mess it up. And we have to choose sides. And uh, um, throughout history, if you like, there have been two kinds of people. There are those who have struggled for power and those who have struggled for human decency and dignity and justice. And these are not parallel paths, they meander. But when they merge together, 
then power is being directed towards human human uh, humanness towards justice towards decency and dignity but when they move away some will continue to choose the role of power and some will choose this one it's, and this is something that we have to the future generation will also have to understand because the temptations of power are very great uh, and to subordinate everything to the question of power uh, rather than to actually seek to merge them and make them more powerful and that's what we have to try and do but that's something for younger generation you're younger than me so uh, i'm not going to be around much so you have to think more seriously about it <laughs> thank you so much ajin thank you